Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. Wow, there are a lot of y'all out there. Good to see everybody. I'm Joel. Some of you are going, who is that guy up there? I've been gone for the last few weeks. I'm the teaching guy around here, but I have been gone for the last few weeks at another, a couple other churches actually filling in. So just really great to be back with y'all. And we're, con- we're actually, we're starting a new series today called Not This Again. Our theme this year is Do It Again, where we've been talking about how God is always faithful. God is always going to do his thing and be faithful. But he calls on us to be consistent and faithful in our walk as well. And we were called to plant seeds and then water those seeds and tend to them, believing that, man, on the other side of it, there is a harvest if we'll stay faithful. But one of the hardest things to do is when the challenge comes, something falls apart in our lives, it is so easy to revert back to old patterns. And we go, not this again. And so many times in our relationships, this is a relationship series, we're going to be talking about those patterns that we fall into where we feel like a relationship is stuck. So I've, I've traveled all over the world. I've been in all sorts of wild situations. Um, I've led teams all over the world. I've hiked mountains. I've started businesses. And at this point in my life, I feel pretty confident in my ability to navigate almost any situation. But there are a few situations that when I see them coming, I know I'm doomed. I know I'm not getting out of this unscathed or unwounded or unhurt in some way because there's just no way like this. Whenever I see it coming, I go, oh, no, not this again. One of those is when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, notice anything different about me? I I know I'm doomed because I'm going to notice the wrong thing, right? Like, Oh, are you pregnant? No. Oh, you're not. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, you know, oh, th- this was a hard one. When I'll, like, I'll even know there's something. Like, I'll know Emily's going to get a haircut. And then she'll come back and she'll go, hey. And I'm like, oh, hey, that's not bad. Which is apparently a wrong answer for a haircut, right? She'll be like, that's, I can't say. There's certain situations I get into where I'm like, I just don't know the right answer to say. And I'm just, some of us guys, you can relate to that. You're like, I don't know what to say in this situation. I can never win. Even if I think I said the right thing, I did not say the right thing. Uh, there was this guy that lived with us for a while. And uh, he always, he wanted to look super spiritual, right? I've concluded that he just wanted to look super spiritual. So he would always kind of corner me. We had a pretty big house, but I'd be walking through the hall. And he'd be like, hey, Joel. Do you, do you know what Malachi 3.7 says? And I'd be like, no, Bob, I don't know offhand what Malachi 3.7 says. And he'd go, do, well, this is what it says. And he'd, read, and he'd be like, do you know what that means, Joel? And I'd be like, no, Bob, but I know you're going to tell me. And I came to like, I would start to avoid this guy because I knew that he was always going to try and corner me and make, like, make me see how spiritually smart he was. And I know that we've all got life in our life. We've got situations where you go, man, there's certain people that when you see them coming, you're like, oh, no. No, no, no. I do not want to have this conversation. You see it on the caller ID. It's great nowadays we have caller ID, right? So you can screen them out. And uh, we've all got people in our lives where you go, not I don't want to talk to them. We've all got situations where, like, maybe in your life, there's a situation where, like, the thing where you say this, don't, oh, oh, no, not this again, is, like, whenever your husband goes and hangs out with those people, those friends of his, and you're like, oh, man, not this again. When he comes back, he's going it's gonna, to, it's going to turn into a fight. I know it is. Or maybe you have your, your, your wife that every time you're like, man, every time she goes and she hangs out with her mom, <laughs> It's that conversation again. Here comes that conversation again. Or every time, you know, somebody, you pick up the phone, you're like, oh, it's him again. Here we go. It's going to be this again. And we get into these, these situations where it's like, we know it's screwed up and messed up. <laughs> we know we're not responding right. We know they're not going to respond right. But we just find ourselves in these situations where we're going, ah, oh, not this again. Anybody relate to that? We've all got situations with that. Because... The the fact is, we've all got patterns to our behavior. And if you hang around with somebody long enough, you'll see their pattern. You know that every time he goes over here, he comes back this way. 
I've noticed recently my daughter, when she watches certain TV shows, she gets a little snarky with me. And I'm like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You ain't going to get snarky with me. I'm turning off that TV show. We've all got these patterns. I see when, when this happens, then that happens. And what, what typically happens is we, des- we can't necessarily change the, the stimulus that causes the thing to happen, but we just get into it. And as soon as it happens, the walls go, go up. We go, oh no, not this again, but here we go. And we've got these defense mechanisms. And sometimes our patterns came from stuff that we learned as a kid growing up. You had to respond a certain way so you wouldn't get picked on or so your dad wouldn't constantly nag on you or compare you to your sibling. And we get these response mechanisms, but a lot of times we don't need those anymore. I can't tell you how many men I talk to who they're still trying to prove they're enough to their dad, and their dad's been dead for 15 years. And they've got these wacky response mechanisms, like you don't have to prove it, but they feel in general that they're not enough. And so they've got these defense mechanisms. And we've all got these ways of responding. And, and the crazy thing is when you're, when you're in a relationship with somebody, you start to see those patterns over and over again. And sometimes we get sucked back into the pattern and go, oh, here we go again. And we realize it too late. Oh, man, I just got sucked back in. I'm back in this argument again. We're arguing about this again. He's doing this again because he hung out with those losers, right? <laughs> There's these patterns. And it's really hard to break patterns. In fact, I think patterns are more about, breaking patterns are more about learning, more, it's more than about learning something new. I think it's about undoing something old. And here's a reality you can hang your hat on. The only thing harder than learning something new is unlearning something old. Because when you've had a response mechanism to something for a while, a pattern, it's so natural to you that it feels like part of you. Well, I'm just an angry person. Dad was angry. Grandpa was angry. It runs in our blood. No, you learned that. And it's really hard to unlearn it because you figured out how to navigate life with that response. Oh, I'm just a fearful person. We've always been fearful people. We just, we know our place. We don't venture out. We don't try and do anything too bold because we just know, you know, our family, we're not made to do great things. We're just, you know, we've always been kind of failures. And and you get in these mindsets and you get these patterns and you start to respond to the world in that way. Well, Jesus comes along and he says, guys, I've got some new truths I want you to learn. And you're going to learn those new truths. But in order to adopt those new truths, you've got to unlearn some truths. So tomorrow, uh, I I do this daily thing where I go through a a chapter in Ecclesiastes, or a verse in Ecclesiastes. And tomorrow's Ecclesiastes verse, Ecclesiastes 3, 6, I think it is. It says, there's a time to seek and there's a time to lose. And I thought, why would he say there's a time to seek and a time to lose? And the conclusion I've come to is whenever you seek the truth or you seek a new way of life, you're going to find. Jesus promises if you seek, you'll find. But anytime you find something new, it requires letting go of something old. And that can be really hard because sometimes when you let go of the old way, it literally feels like losing a part of yourself. You go, man, if I don't have my anger, I have no power. It's for a lot of guys. Anger is power for us. Man, if I don't have this, if, if I don't have this fear of failure, I don't have any protection. Like there's nothing holding me back from trying something and I really might fail. I don't have an excuse anymore. And to lose that feels like you're losing part of yourself. And the crazy thing is Jesus says this. He says, if anybody will come after me, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And then he says, whoever tries to save their life will lose it. But if whoever loses it for my sake will gain it. There's an element of loss that comes with any time we do something new. We learn something new, and then we have to let go of the old. And it's really hard to let go of those patterns sometimes. And I think there's two main reasons that it's so hard to let go of those patterns. Those things that have worked for us, well, we think they've worked, but they actually haven't worked. Because if you notice when you're in a relationship with somebody, uh, they know that you've got an issue with that, and they regularly bring it to your attention. (laughs) Two reasons. One is we have conflicting messages. It's really hard to learn something new because we have this old programming for one in our heads and we have these constantly conflicting messages that tell us the opposite of what Jesus says is true about us this is why it's so important that you're in church every week and here's the really crazy thing about it in church every week is still not enough to beat the negative messages that you're hearing about who you are every week you're going to hear the truth of God's word, but if if you're depending on this to get you through the week, it ain't going to work because the studies have shown this. It takes five positives to cancel out any negative that you hear. Five positives. 
Now you think about this. This is why your words with your kids are so powerful. I'll say one negative thing to my kid and that will stick with her after I've said all these positive things. It takes five positives to cancel out any negative that I say to my daughter. They've shown in businesses that the teams that work really well, when they confront a negative issue, they bring 5.6 positives, that's the exact number, 5.6 positives to the table before they talk about the negative issue because otherwise all that sticks in your head is the negative issue. It's going to take five positives to undo the negative that has been spoken over you. And listen, some of you guys are starting in the hole here because you have had negative spoken over you your whole life. Nobody's ever believed in you. God has believed in you, and you're just now figuring that out. But it's going to take a long time to unprogram that. And what it's going to take is a lot of truth in your head. Because you know, who, you know the worst negatives that we hear oftentimes, the, the, the conflicting messages? All are, are in our own head. Somebody told you you weren't enough a long time ago, and you've believed that lie. And when things get hard, you're like, oh, I did it again. I screwed it up. I messed it up. I always do this. And you're going to have to unprogram that if you're going to walk in the freedom that God has for you. You've got to break that pattern. And it's hard. Because, I mean, you're, you ever heard that, that, state, that saying, wherever you go, there you are? <laughs> you can change your environment. You still take you with you. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of my life. I'm moving to Hawaii. Well, guess who's still going to be in Hawaii with you? <laughs> it's hard. And so you have to unlearn these things that you've told yourself or that people have told you. And it takes five positives to every one negative. And that's why so many of you, you've been told lies about who you are your whole life. And God's coming and saying, no, man, you are a chosen child of God. I've had a plan for you. You're not an accident. You're here right now for a purpose. God has put you on this planet for such a time as this. You are gifted. You are talented in a very unique and special way that he put in you. You have a message to share with the world that only you can share about his redemption. And you're sitting over here in this mental pattern saying, I got nothing to give. And God's like, don't you see and this is why it's so important to be around positive influences all the time. In fact, uh, in Philippians, the, to Philippian church, Paul writes this. He says, guys, finally, brothers, he's wrapping this, me this message up, and he says this, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, you need to get those things in your head, and you need to be thinking about them all the time. Now, let's be honest. How many of us are thinking about this kind of stuff all the time versus how many of us are thinking about how we just don't add up. I'm a failure. I always do stupid things. I keep messing things up. I'm, I've, I'm such a shameful, guilt-riddled person. And you come in on Sunday and you feel like, oh, God forgave me. But then you go back out there and people remind you of your past. And you go, oh. And it only takes one negative to deflate everything that happens on a Sunday morning. And this is why you got to stay in the Word of God. You got to be pumping your head full of the truth of who God says you are. And I'm not talking about ignoring negative realities. I'm talking about overpowering the negative realities with the truth of who God says and indoctrinating yourself. Really, it is indoctrinating yourself in a whole new way of seeing things. Because there's so many conflicting messages telling you the opposite of the truth in this world. And sometimes it's from our families, sometimes it's from our own voices in our head. Sometimes it's, there's a verse that talks about vain imaginations. It's vain imaginations are things when you think it's about you, but it really has nothing to do with you. <laughs> you ever met people like that? Like, this has nothing to do with you, but you made it about you? Yeah, I know you hate me. I wasn't even talking about you. Right? It's a vain imagination. And listen, we just sang a second ago about break every stronghold. That's a, kind of a weird word. A stronghold in your mind is something that won't give way. And it's just standing there kind of blocking the way for you to move forward. And many of you have strongholds in your family that have been there for years because somebody spoke a lie over your family or somebody made a really a sinful decision. And there's been this stronghold sitting there and it's this wall. And you can't get past it. Jesus is the answer. He's the one that goes, let me kick through that and get you. We're going to break through the wall here. And listen, the first one through the wall is always the bloodiest. You may be the one that has to pay the price to break the... To break the break the curse for your family and you go man I walked out of there all bloody but then when you do it people go wow we could do this and you break through it and yeah you you don't look much better for it but on the other side you've broken through the wall for your family and you've paid the price and you change the course of the patterns that have been going through your family that's what a stronghold is and Jesus gives you the power to break through those in your family so the negative voices 
We've got to overpower those. The second thing is this. We just forget. <laughs> I'm very forgetful. My daughter, she memorizes scripture as part of her school curriculum. And uh, every time she comes home spouting a verse, I'm like, take my money, school. You got my money. Like she is walking out with the word of God in her. Sometimes she'll come out with a verse and I'll be like, oh, I forgot that was in there. I've been reading the Bible for 40 years, but it's a big book. It's actually a library of books. And sometimes she'll come out with a verse. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is like, I needed that. But I forgot. I just forgot it was in there because we're bombarded with so much every day in our minds and our hearts. And we just forget. We forget who we are sometimes. And we forget who God says we are. Which is why it's so important to be connected in community. Sunday morning alone ain't going to cut it. Sunday morning and reading your Bible ain't going to cut it. In fact, I tell people all the time like this. You and Jesus may have it all figured out. Me and Jesus, me study the Bible together every morning and Jesus and me, we got the, we're taking on the world together. But listen, you and Jesus may have it figured out, but it's how you live in community with others that proves that you and Jesus have it figured out. And this is why community is so important, and this is why we are launching small groups this week. Because small groups are such an important element of how a church, when it gets to this size, we can't know, everybody can't know everybody. It's just impossible. But in a small group, you get to know people on a closer level, and they get to know the challenges you're facing, and they can pray for you, and they can call and check on you. And when things get hard, they're there to rally around you and take care of you. And when things get hard for somebody else in the group, you get to rally around, because when you're up, they may be down, and when you're down, they may be up, and they can, you care for each other. Sean Acor, he wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage, and he basically said the number one predictor of somebody's ability to weather difficult challenges is their social, en their, their engagement with community when things get hard. And a lot of times what we do is we pull out of community when we're, things are getting hard. We're like, well, I don't want anybody to know I'm going through struggles. And that's the worst possible time for you to do that. That's the time you need to push into community because the, 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 what you need is you need to be reminded that there are people that are there for you that there are people that care about you, and it usually tends to come through being people that are the hands and feet of Jesus. They're just like, wow, you were Jesus to me in that situation. You've got to be in community, and you're not going to make it if you're not. And that's why I would encourage you, man, find a small group and get involved. We've got small groups coming up. They're going to be about the sermons. Uh, that we're going to go through the sermon like we share on Sunday. We'll meet again and talk about how to apply what was shared in, in the message to your life on a daily basis. We've got small groups for marriage. Listen, men, please don't wait until she's left to realize there's a problem with your marriage. A lot of guys that come up and they're like, oh, man, you know, hey, can you help me with my marriage? And I, I'm almost ready to ask, well, how long ago did she leave you, man? Because most guys, we only cry out for help when it gets so bad that it's blatantly in front of us that it's that bad. I'm telling you this, don't be that person. If things are a struggle right now, listen, there's always struggles in marriage. I have a perfect marriage, but there's still struggles. <laughs> Most of the perfection's coming from her end. But uh, it's always hard. It's just hard because when two people come together, it's like two mighty streams. Everybody's like, oh, it's two halves coming a whole. No, that's not what marriage is. Two marriage, marriage should be two holes coming together to make the ideal strength that God is talking about in a, in a, in a person. Where you're, they're, they're rubbing off the bad parts of you and you're rubbing off the bad parts of them. And where you're weak, they're, they're making you stronger because they're strong in that area. And there's always contending. There's battles. There's struggles that are going on in marriage. That's the sign of a healthy marriage. And you need help walking through that because none of us get it. We're not born with an instruction manual for marriage, the Bible, but we need to learn how to work that out in your marriage, in your relationships. We've got re-engage starting. We've got small groups for men. Men are under attack in our world today. Men, we are called to be strong and powerful. Don't, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Men are called to be strong and powerful. Societies thrive when men are strong and powerful. And I'm not talking about going around beating up people. I'm talking about meekness. Meekness is where you say, I've got a sword and I know how to use it. But I'm keeping it sheathed until the proper time. Just because you're weak and not, it, weakness is not a virtue. <laughs> strength is a virtue. Meekness is a virtue, but meekness is strength under control. We've got a group starting on Saturday mornings. Emilio is going to be leading it. It's at 8 a.m. right here in the gathering place. And this isn't a uh, let's all sit around and talk about our emotions group. This is a group where you're going to do physical activity. You're going to be working out. You're going to have some people training you how to work out. Maybe you're saying, this is, I need to get in shape, but I don't even know how to start. It's a great place to do it. 
All these small groups are ways that you can strengthen your walk with God and get in community with others. And we've got to be around that because we've got to be reminded over and over and over again. And one Sunday isn't going to work. And here's a, here's a really tragic stat. Barna did a study recently, I think it was Barna, that said the average regular church attendance, these are the people that go to church regularly, attend 1.2 Sundays a month. That ain't no good, y'all. You're not going to make it if you're only engaged with the community of God 1.2 Sundays a month. There's certain things you get when you're hanging out with the body of Christ that you're not going to get anywhere else. You are not going to get it at soccer. And I know you want your kid to get a soccer scholarship so you don't have to pay for their college. But one of these days, they're not, I doubt they're going to be a soccer pro. And on the other side of it, though, are they going to have a walk with God because you prioritized soccer? Or because you prioritized a football game on Sunday and you just had to have everything right, the chips and the dip and the steak. And... This is the real stuff. And people go, why did my kid leave God? Well, well because that's what you represented for them. Well. This is where it's so important. Paul, or, uh, Peter, he says this. He says, he's writing this letter. And he says, dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. He says, I know I wrote about this once, but I'm writing you another letter. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I love the King James Version. It says, it says, I've written this to stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. I just want to remind you what you probably already know, but you forgot. It says this, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. And then he says this. I think this is fascinating. He says, don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. I think that... the it's the easiest to forget when God's taking a lot longer to come through for us than we had thought he would. When raising that kid the way you wanted to raise them is taking a lot longer and it's a lot harder than you thought it would be and you face some setbacks. When the marriage faces some setbacks, when the finance faces some setbacks and you're going, God, I thought you were going to bail me out. He says, look, I'm not, and this, I love this line. It says this, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's not slow. But oftentimes when, when, when he's slow, we forget and we go back. When we forget, what do we do? We go back to our old pattern. That's what happened with the children of Israel. They're delivered from freedom. And they're like, this freedom stinks. I preferred being in bondage. At least I had some scraps to eat. And how many times do we do that? God's like, you're free. And you're like, yeah, but this is hard. I have to take personal responsibility and do some stuff. And he's like, yeah, but you're free to do that stuff. Well, I'd just rather eat the scraps and be whipped on the back daily and told what to do. And unfortunately, a lot of us would prefer the bondage of slavery to the freedom that God offers us because we'd rather go back to those old patterns when life gets hard because at least you know your way around. And that's where you end up in relationships getting stuck. And you go, and your, your person you're with goes, not this again. Why does he still believe that about himself? Doesn't he know I love him? Why does she still believe this about herself? Doesn't she know I love her? It's because we fall back into those old patterns and Christ has set us free. And this is why it's so important that we stay consistently focused on what the vision is that God has for us and the vision we have for our families. Because here's the important thing about vision. A vision is simply a picture of what the future could look like. And vision doesn't stick. You say it once. I make the joke. You hear about the guy who told his wife, uh, she's like, do you think I'm beautiful? And he says, woman, I told you you were beautiful when I married you. And if I think anything different, I'll tell you. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Vision has to be constantly represented. You have to constantly remind people. If you're a leader of a business and you go, why? Why do I have to repeat this over and over again? Because you're focused on the vision, but your employees aren't. So you make sure they're focused on the vision. Southwest Airlines, I used to work there. And we had this big thing. Southwest Airlines is an airline. We deal with airplanes. We had a big sign in the back room that said, we are in the people business people business. I thought we were in the airline business. No, everything we do, getting a plane out on time, getting people on the plane, it's for the people. And we would forget that sometimes. And you get hung up in the, the, the busyness of trying to get the air, keep the airline running and you forget people are at the core of what we do. Without people, we ain't got no airline. I think that's a message for life. You're in the people business. People are the most important thing. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. And vision doesn't stick. It's got to be represented. And the best way to represent it is to represent it in the way you live. Represent, represent. My dad, every Sunday, get up, we're going to church. 
I'd be like, Dad, I don't want to go to church. Why do I have to go to church? And he'd always say, because I'm the pastor. <laughs> That's not what he'd say, but it felt like that. And I'd go. And now I'm so grateful he made me in. We were in church anytime the doors were open. I'm not kidding, man. I've been to thousands of church services. But here's the thing. He didn't just make us go to church throughout the week. He represented what the vision was for our family. And church was just kind of an affirmation of what I was already seeing my dad live throughout the week. My dad's the man that's most like Jesus I've ever met. But he represented that. And you may be the one that's called to represent that say we're going to break the pattern and I'm going to represent a new pattern and you'll fall back into your old pattern sometimes we all do but the key is to keep that vision in front of your family and say this is where we're going I've got four key visions for my family one is I want to make sure that we are a family that is focused on wisdom wisdom is just understanding God's word and how it applies to your life you can stop unnecessary suffering in life when you apply God's wisdom courage is the next one I want my, my daughter to understand you're never going to be without fear you got to do it in spite of the fear you just move towards the thing that scares you little by little, trusting God's going to keep you alive and, and, and care for you. The other thing is open hands. I want to make sure that my, my family, everybody knows this about me, that I want people to know this about me, that man, whatever God gives me, at any point he may ask me to release it and give it to others. And I'm saying, that's cool, man. I'll do it. If I have to be a fool for the sake of others, I'll do it, right? I'm going to be open-handed with what he gives me because if he can get it to me, get it through me, he'll give it to me. And I can be a conduit of that. And then the final one for me is humility. I just want to make sure that I'm not undermining what God has made me to be, but I'm not overshooting it, right? You want to write an accurate pers pers uh, perspective on who you are. You're not nothing. You're somebody very valuable in God's hand, but you're also not that big of a deal, Joel. And I want to constantly remind my family that. And we're constantly aiming at that. And I'm hoping I'm living that out. And more than even saying it, I have to live it for my daughter and my wife and those around me to get it. And that's what I'm trying to do. And vision has to be represented over and over and over again. And that is the do it again element of it. It's the consistency where you say, I'm going to get up and then do this every day. And we may face some setbacks. We may find ourselves in conversations where we're going, I thought we had gotten past this. Or your kid may come in and you go, ah, I thought we were getting victory over this area. Or your husband may come in and you go, ah, I thought we had this beat and you're doing it again. But listen, stay in the game. Don't give up. Stay consistent with it. And you will break those patterns, those strongholds in your life. He will give you the power to do that as you stay consistent and you keep aimed at that vision. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much that you give us the power to conquer these patterns in our lives. So we don't have to say, ah, this again? I thank you, Lord, that as these this agains come up, Lord, you're going to give us wisdom to say, Lord, this is my opportunity to break this pattern. What do I need to do to change the course of my life and my family's life? And I thank you as we seek you, you're going to give us wisdom and guidance. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, that's literally the first step to take to get on the right path here. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it with all your heart, God is going to come and he's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and he's going to set you up with an eternal address with him in eternity. It starts when you say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>